What I have been able to do as of late is convince him that he's not the God of the Bible. Now, I've been real successful. Did you know that there's a herbivore creature plated in spikes and armor with a tail the size of an oak tree? Head like a lion swallowing up rivers just roaming around back then? Yeah, apparently. The behemoth. This goliath of a beast was one of the first talked about. Not the first beast. That's a completely different thing. Also terrifying. The behemoth. God's secret weapon, and apparently the first thing he created. Hadn't made us in his image yet, so uh, this hippo tank Elder Scrolls boss was what God went with. One of the most popular and revered creatures in the Bible, quote, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass like an ox, he moveth his tail like a cedar, his bones are as strong as pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Yeah, this is definitely a dinosaur, right? Right? Scholars seem to think that the behemoth is an aggressive exaggeration of a large hippopotamus or rhinoceros. Opening up its mouth and swallowing a river could literally mean it's just an animal thirsty. In 2003, French scientists working in Pakistan claimed to have discovered an extinct species of rhinoceros called a Baluk Ethereum, which was much larger, much scarier, and matched the physical description given in the Book of Job. Yeah, that's terrifying stuff. Number four, cherubim. These cute flying baby angels we see on soap ads and bottles are a lot scarier and much more sinister than the blonde cupids we're used to seeing. The cherubs, or cherubim, are God's throne bearers and appear over 90 times in the Bible. The Hebrew text says cherubim is a celestial winged being who represents God's spirit on earth and symbolizes the worship of God. In Ezekiel, cherubim are described as angelic creatures with two sets of wings and four faces faces. Lion, ox, human, and eagle. Okay, this is getting scarier and scarier. The four faces of the cherubim apparently represent the four domains of God's rule. The lion represents wild animals, man represents humanity, ox represents domestic animals, and the eagle represents birds. Aren't those all wild animals? I don't know. The cherubim appear in several texts of the Bible, including Genesis, Ezekiel, Kings, and Revelation. Yeah, so lots of people were seeing these things, and they all kind of sound somewhat the same. They all oddly say four faces, like every which way they turned, they could see a face. Some say, quote, they move quickly, using a wheel within a wheel, and their wings cover their body. Question, what's with all the wheels? People just like looking up into the sky all day must have had like severe floaters in their eyes because a wheel and a cute baby angel thing look completely different, no? A conjoined wingspan of the four cherubim are described as forming a divine chariot, the so-called mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Two cherubim make the Ark and form a space through which Yahweh would appear in Ezekiel's visions. The status of the cherubim are a sort of vehicle for Yahweh in the book of Samuel. So in a sense, they're kind of God's messengers, you know, bringing things up and down from him and to him, including him. Gotcha, a vehicle. Yeah, a vehicle. These images are terrifying. Yeah, and that's a mothership right there. That's a mothership, okay? Number three, unicorns. Hold up, this is scarier than the devil, right? Unicorns, really? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the glittery ones with Farrah Fawcett hair like Hercules rides. More like a firstborn bull giant with a huge spear on its head. He has majesty and his horns are the horns of a wild ox and with them he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. Okay, yeah, that's really aggressive. I guess unicorns were a little bit scarier in the Bible, huh? Couple times these things are brought up too. It seems like a lot of people were seeing these. Yeah, I'd say a hunk in a suit on a television series is much less scary than a monster horse goring you to death. A ram is mentioned nine times in the Hebrew Bible. It's been translated to unicorn in the King James Version, and some translations as oryx, which was seen as a wild ox or rhinoceros. Quote, and the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Uh, yeah, harsh. I mean, rhinos and other single horned animals do do this. The Bible describes unicorns skipping like calves, traveling like bulls, and bleeding when they die. So they were real and very mortal, mostly believed to be an exaggeration though. Even Julius Caesar speaks of them. Quote, a little below the elephant in size and appearance, color and shape of a bull, their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast. Were the ancients seeing like giant extinct rhinos? Or were these flying evil narwhals just goring everyone to the end of the earth? Who knows? Sure sounds like it. Number two, locusts. Dude, I'm already afraid of the 12 inch flying praying mantises that do exist today. I can't imagine what these things looked like. Imagine a dog sized flying insect blocking out the sun because there's so many of them. 
Abaddon's locusts. These things were terrifying. The Bible has this to say about them. The fifth angel, apparently Abaddon, sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. These demon bugs are well detailed in the Bible. They're described as, quote, horse-like creatures preparing for battle, adorned with crowns of gold above their head. Their face is like a man, but woman's hair with lion's teeth. Their body was locust-like, covered with iron breastplates. They have scorpion-like stings on their tails and razor-sharp claws, and the sound of their army will be like a million horses marching to the battlefield. Dude, that's a locust? Like a locust, the bug? No, 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 I don't think so. They will be freed by their master Abaddon from the bottomless pit and will torment all of the remaining sinners on earth for five months. Abaddon is described as the king of the army of locusts. Yeah, guy's really into bugs. Yeah, that's like some fear factor stuff right there. Just like a million bugs swarming you? No, no thanks. And coming in at number one, the dragon. Okay, there's some speculation here that this thing is the devil himself. The devil and the dragon. But also this thing apparently lives with the devil. I don't know, people were saying mixed things, but important thing is things weren't too literal back then and they were really spiritual. People were just trying to explain what they were seeing and feeling the best way they could. But yes, there was dragons. Yeah, we have the skeleton bones. Okay? And before you're picturing something fun like Dudley the Dragon or the ones that talk in The Hobbit who sit atop gold, no, no, no. Picture when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. Yeah, this thing. Terrifying. Tremendous strength of Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Job 41, 18, 23. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all the angels. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from its mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for thousands years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Okay, yeah, that sounds like one giant amazing cutscene from a God of War game. Just chucking a dragon into a pit? Also, it's 2022. We better lock that thing back up. It's been more than a thousand years now, no? Quote, And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Okay, so it wears seven crowns. Maybe this thing is the devil. It's mentioned numerous times in the Bible. I've seen Game of Thrones. This thing is scary. Yeah. Number five, Nephilim. This one I can get behind for sure. How the pyramids were built still baffles me, and reading all about these things at least makes my brain relax for a second. The giants, the talls, the long neck people, the Nephilim. Again, never been a Bible guy myself, so no judgment if you say all this happened, but I'm just catching up on all this stuff. But in short, the Nephilim were like the offspring of angels and human women, according to Genesis 6, 1, 4, and Jude. The Nephilim are also mentioned in Numbers 13, 33, but it is likely that by this time in Israel's history, Nephilim was used as a term for a tall, intimidating peoples. It's plausible that the Nephilim were both half angels and half giants, making them absolutely huge and absolutely Absolutely super strong. The Nephilim were the children of the sons of gods and daughters of men. And Christian scholars have theorized that the sons of gods were actually these demonic fallen angels who reproduced with women. Being the offspring of partial angelic heredity, the Nephilim were considered mighty men who are of old the men of renown. The ancients. These people were huge, claiming that they were like five times the size of an average man. In the Hebrew Bible, a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and length who lived both before and after the flood were called Nephilimus, sometimes translated to giants. Even the fallen ones from the Hebrew nephil, meaning to fall. Seems like these people were writing about similar stuff, huh? 
Spooky. Number four, 200 million horsemen. This next one is not really a creature as much as it's the end of a lot of all of us. All this Armageddon stuff they were saying, that's some pretty strange stuff that's on its way. Book of Revelation stuff, you know? Quote, I saw as God wanted to show me the horses and the men on them. The men had pieces of iron on their chests. These were red like fire and blue like the sky and yellow like sulfur. The heads of the horses looked like the heads of lions. Fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. One third part of all man was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. Word for word, horsemen or ancient biblical technology? This sounds horrifying. Also, 200 million? That's a lot of flying flaming horses just trucking around the skies and sands like giant tanks firing fire fire out of their mouths and nose. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of all this came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Hmm. Okay. You put a Baja hoodie on me at a Dave Matthews concert and hear me saying all that stuff, you probably just think I'm some sci-fi stoner. Nope. This is riveting material, folks. I need to read this thing front to back. Apparently, this force was supposed to have taken out or is going to take out a third of the entire world's population. I know like three things that can do that. Pandemics, missiles, and floods. However, if men and horses showed up with lion heads breathing fire, it's safe to say it's game over. Number three, the Leviathan. Okay, at first I was like, oh, that's a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. No, 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 this vicious monster was actually modeled after this vicious monster. The Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute massive sea monster who's impervious to human weapons, breathes fire, and emits smoke from his nostrils. Uh, yeah, so this is a Zelda boss for sure. The Leviathan is probably related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who represents primeval chaos, as with pretty much every other biblical creature does. Hey, these things aren't meant to be cute and fuzzy. There's some less exciting theories that insist the Leviathan is just a dramatic interpretation of a crocodile or anaconda or maybe a plesiosaur resembling something like the Loch Ness Monster. But that doesn't explain the breathing fire thing or the size. Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's like 300 miles long. Yeah, terrifying. Scary thing now is many different religions and cultures have their own version of the Leviathan. Tiamat, Hydra, Jormungandr. Maybe this thing was just hunted into extinction. I don't know. What do you think? Number two, Archangel Michael. It is said that the angels are not humans, but creatures made from God's creation. I've also seen what the Bible describes angels looking like, and it's not handsome people with wings. Apparently, a lot of these things, people really couldn't even describe what they were seeing in front of them. But we'll get to what these things look like in a minute. Of those creatures, Satan, aka Lucifer, is one, the one. However, here is even one creature that Satan fears more than any creature, and that's fellow Archangel Michael or Saint Michael. Some say they're brothers, some say they were on the same team for a bit. This is some good stuff, people. Quote, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 7, 9. Okay, so hold on. He and them are all down here with us? That's terrifying. Apparently Michael led that army, that one, so whatever scares Satan, scares the hell out of me as well. Also, all these pictures and statues of him and like window panes are all of him like wielding a giant sword made of light, just stepping on Satan's back as a hero. That's pretty intimidating, not gonna lie. And coming in at the number one spot, Ophanim. Okay, so what angels actually looked like, apparently was like giant geometrical feathers with eyes and a consciousness. Some had horns, some had hooves, lots of golden metal colors. This next thing doesn't even make sense to my brain. I feel like this is an anthill trying to understand an iPhone. Quote, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with his four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparked like topaz and all four looked alike. 
each appeared to be made like a wheel, intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures were faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Ezekiel 1, 15, 18. Uh, first off, is this thing even a creature? Yeah, everything I see here is an alien. Is this just us trying to process some sort of like energy being with eyes? Because if I saw Lucifer that looks like the hunk on the Netflix show, and then I saw this thing? One of the Dead Sea Scrolls interprets them as angels. Late sections of the Book of Enoch interprets them as class of celestial beings who don't sleep and guard the throne of God. Whatever these thing or things are, it sounds and looks absolutely horrifying. How could you paint that on a ceiling? I would just give up and paint wings in a halo as well. For real though, like that is a spaceship of some sort, isn't it? I mean, I understand the times, maybe the science wasn't there, but this thing is straight out of a sci-fi novel. In fourth place, we have Vine, an Earl and King of Hell. This Earl commands a simple 36 legions of demons. Because I know y'all are gonna make me do the math for this one, a legion is anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 demons. So roughly between 108 to 216,000 demons. Where's my gold star for calculating that? And how are there so many demons? The significance of his name seems to be from the Latin word venea, vine, which is also the name given to an ancient war machine made of wood and covered with leather and branches used to overthrow walls. In terms of his appearance, once summoned, he will show up resembling a lion and holding a viper in his hands. Now, I don't do well with snakes. So if you request him to change that appearance, he will present in human form with long black hair, black wings, and now holding a golden cane. I know there's people out there who might be attracted to this, present company included, but don't take that as encouragement to summon him. Known as one of the most difficult demons to summon and work with, he is also one of the only demons who can identify witches and warlocks without being previously informed about their abilities, along with having the ability to to tell the past and future, which I can see is kind of tempting. Vine is insensitive to humanity and cares little for harming those who summon him, making him wildly unpredictable and dangerous to summon, along with having the power to take souls without requiring permission. I repeat, dangerous. Right in the middle of the pack, in third place, we have Pazuzu. If your first response was to say bless you, we have the same sense of humor. You may be familiar with references made to him in The Exorcist and the House of Ashes video game, but we're not talking about Linda Blair's acting today. As an apotropaic entity, he was considered both a destructive and dangerous wind, but also a repellent to other demons, one who might safeguard the home from their influence if he was in the right mood. Remember, if he was in the right mood, kind of like me sometimes. He is quoted as introducing himself by stating, I am Pazuzu, son of Anubu, king of the evil Lilu demons. I was enraged in violent motion against the strong mountains and ascended them. Lilu demons are the class to which Pazuzu and his leagues of demons belong. There is also a notable connection to the earlier Babylonian personifications of the four winds. These beings, as depicted on several cylinder seals, have wings and each represents a different direction of the north, south, east, and west winds. It's important to note that Noted professor of ancient studies, Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals. Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals, which is similar to the posture in Pazuzu's physical depiction. More connections appear in later seals, as this same bent over figure takes on talons and a scorpion's tail. The main difference in their depictions is the head, and the conclusion was made that it is Pazuzu's body and not his head that denotes him as a wind demon. Another scholar, Scott Neweagle, asserts that Pazuzu's possession of four wings links to the term kipatu, meaning circle, loop, circumference, and totality, suggesting his control over all cardinal directions of wind was inherited from his predecessors. Pazuzu was often depicted with a man's body, the head of a lion or a dog, talons for feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpentine phallus. Around now, you might be thinking, Pazuzu is a long name. He has to have some sort of a, you know, nickname or other moniker, right? Sure. He's been called the agony of mankind, suffering of mankind, or disease of mankind. Take your pick. This god of wind and plague is known as Lucifer's right hand man and has the power to control and rule over other evil spirits, being known to bring forth droughts and famine. It is said that he conspired with Lucifer to overthrow God and they were thrown out of heaven together. He is fond of corrupting the innocent and good, being known to offer help that appears good and benevolent, but actually requires recipients to request more of his assistance, sending them further and further into his debt sentencing them to an afterlife of eternal agony. See, reality is agony enough, so 
I'll pass. Our runner-up for today is Sergat, first mentioned in history in 1517, whose deceptive and cunning mind make him one of the most tricky demons you could possibly think of summoning. Due to his name, he is associated closely with Saturdays. Sure, he might be the least known demon on this list, lacking the background detail that emphasizes the other demons, but he is still very much to be feared. He is known as the one who can open all locks, which may seem a little silly on the surface level, but once summoned, he is impossible to escape or to conceal yourself from unless it's on his terms. Targets of Sergat are relentlessly pursued until found, and then presented with imagery until they go mad. He was the last demon to be summoned by known demon hunter and documentarist Pope Honorarius in his grimoire. Honorarius had thoroughly documented the strengths and weaknesses of every demon he summoned during his research into the oncoming War Against Demons, but had only written ability to open locks with Zergat before his untimely death, leaving history to believe Zergat was responsible for this event. Now, I'm not going to spell out how to summon him, because I hope I've made it clear enough by now that I exist to discourage that kind of behavior, but I did find it kind of neat that one would need a nail from an old coffin to do so. Oh, and before I forget, Zergat is invisible when he manifests, making him easy to lose track of. And in first place, we have Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Lord of Dung, and God of Filth himself. He is described visually as a small and hunched over creature with red or purple skin, ram horns, a forked tongue, and a long tail along with incredibly powerful wings. Kind of sounds like a D&D character. He often prefers to appear as a fly when summoned, which may sound innocent until you consult history. Flies were believed to have been born from rotting flesh and uh, plagues. According to Christian beliefs, he began his career as a false god, convincing men to worship him and trick them, so he could give faulty advice that would harm instead of helping those in need. Before in the comments asks for a Bible citation, since I haven't been including them for all of the listings today, I'll mention it now. In Mark 3.22, the scribes accused Jesus Christ of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The name also appears in the expanded version in Matthew 12.24, 27, and Luke 11, 15, 18, 19, as well as in Matthew 10, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Funny. Hanging around this spooky stuff has me quoting the Bible more than I ever thought I would in my lifetime. Guess I should have paid more attention to my middle school religion classes, or when I was altar serving as a kid, instead of just figuring out the perfect angle to tip a candle at to splash wax on my arm. What? I never said I was a normal kid. Beelzebub is commonly described as placed high in Hell's hierarchy. According to the stories of the 16th century occultist Johann Weyer, Beelzebub led a successful revolt against the devil, is the chief lieutenant officer of Lucifer, the emperor of Hell, and presides over the Order of the Fly. And I thought I was a workaholic. The 17th century exorcist Sebastien Michaelis, in his admirable history, placed Beelzebub among the three most prominent fallen angels, the other two being Lucifer and Leviathan. John Milton, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, published in 1667, identified the unholy trinity of Beelzebub, Lucifer, and Aseroth, with Beelzebub as the second ranking of the many fallen angels, a quote from him claiming, Satan except, none higher sat. In simple English, only second place is Satan here. His specialty is in tormenting mankind, causing wars, instigating murders, and known for his ability to place humans under the spell of other demons upon request. One thing historians haven't been able to settle on is which major sin he represents, with some claiming pride, others gluttony, but also some claim idolatry. Personally, since he allegedly originated from being a false god, I'm going to side with idolatry, but let me know in the comments which one you believe. Coming in number five, we've got Puriel. Not to be confused with the top tier hand sanitizer, although I wouldn't be too mad if you made that mistake, this angel does a similar job to the alcohol based cleaning solution. He purifies and eliminates all sorts of unsavory things. Whether or not that's 99% I can't be sure, but here we are anyway. His job is one that not many would really want to do. Puriel is the angel of punishment. One would think that once you made it to heaven there wouldn't really be a need for that kind of thing, but apparently we're wrong. He watches over the prison in heaven acting as the warden. 
Oh no. He's also responsible for examining each and every soul that makes it up to heaven after dying. During this spot check, he makes sure that the soul is pure enough to be allowed to pass through. Kind of like a TSA check at the airport, but somehow more invasive. Instead of checking your passport and your luggage and making assumptions based on your appearance and background, they're instead reaching into the depths of your soul. Talk about a cavity search, am I right? If you are fit to enter heaven, he will let you pass, although I'm not so sure you'll be the same person after an experience like that. Fail the test, and out you go. Down to hell, or possibly purgatory, to cavort with all sorts of other unworthy individuals. Damn, so close too. Puriel is known for being fiery and pitiless too, so don't count on just barely squeezing by. If he doesn't like what he sees, he's gonna drop you from the clouds faster than you can say bless you. Dang. Maybe he does have a lot in common with Purell. I'm sure he eliminates 99% of potential heavenly residents. I wonder if that could have any long term implications like hand sanitizer and antibiotics do. You know, by leaving some of the stronger, unsavory bits untouched so that they get stronger and no longer be purified by that regular dose. Super bacteria, here we come. Oh man, did I just compare me and the others unworthy of heaven to bacteria? Gotta work on that self esteem. Coming at number four, we've got Simkiel. Dangerously close to Sin Kiel, this is another remorseless, unrepentant angel. Do not put yourself in her sights lest you be utterly annihilated in seconds flat. One has to wonder how an angel becomes the chief of destruction, although I wouldn't recommend asking Simkiel anything about it. She's likely to just cash in on that title in the wildest way possible. Destruction. In addition to her first title, she also is known as the Angel of Vengeance, which works well with those predetermined traits. Destructive and vengeful seem to go hand in hand quite well. Claim revenge through destruction, destroy upon the path of vengeance. What an angel. Simkiel does spend a good amount of time in heaven, commanding other angels, but will often be called down to earth to chastise and purify sinners. Most folks have a hard enough time being chastised by their teachers and employers. Imagine a literal angel from heaven dropping in to give you an earful. My word. Plus, the way most angels purify sinners isn't pleasant. It's not just radiant light zapping you to righteousness in the same way a UV light might disinfect buffet food. You're probably getting smoten. Straight the hell with your sinful ass. She doesn't always work alone either. Many lesser angels receive Simkiel's orders and follow them with fervor. A whole platoon of vengeful, destructive angels on the lookout for sinners and sinner adjacents. I don't know about you folks watching at home, but I don't think too many righteous and pious people are watching top five scary videos. So Simkiel should be on our list of folks to avoid at all costs, as if we could even avoid her in the first place. Oh well, I guess there's only so much you can control in life. Might as well get cleansed by the good guys in the end, right? Coming at number three, we've got NCL. Working closely with Simkiel, NCL is another tough cookie straight out of the clouds. With a name meaning the constrainer, one can assume that nothing good comes from being constrained. Images of prison, the inability to move, and possibly even Stockholm Syndrome are evoked, are they not? All that being said, it's tough to think that an angel who makes regular use of constraints is anyone's safe haven. Unless you're a regular on a smutty roleplay blog, and in that case, you do you. NCL isn't all that bad though. He's often invoked to prevent forgetfulness and stupidity, which, to be honest, we could all use a hand with from time to time. However, if someone were to rely on angelic intervention regularly to keep them in line, well, what hope did they even have in the first place? Apparently, NCL is known for having a very short temper when it comes to these two traits, however, so those who need his help the most are likely to be held in contempt by him. Maybe find a new job, right? Humorless and hard to get along with, NCL is an excellent soldier. In fact, he's one of Michael's greatest warriors, which means if anyone is ever to step to him, things will end very badly for them. Watch out and try to keep tabs on stuff you're supposed to remember. If you fail at this, you could find yourself restrained, constrained, and in NCL's bad books. Coming at number two, we've got Gabriel. Now we're talking about the big ones, the Archangels. Gabriel in particular can be a real pain to deal with. The youngest of the archangels, he is known as the messenger of God. He heralds major changes and brings news from the heavens. So if you run into Gabriel, you can be assured that something monumental is about to happen. You'd better listen closely though, because he doesn't suffer fools. In fact, if he senses that you're not paying close enough attention, he might just silence you forever. That's almost what happened to Zechariah. When Gabriel descended to announce the birth of John the Baptist, Zechariah initially reacted poorly. Seeing this, Gabriel got angry. So angry that he threatened to take away Zechariah's voice. He said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and bring this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Man. 
I can only imagine what happens when he gets into an actual argument with someone. For a being with divine powers, he sure has a short temper. Plus, as God's messenger, Gabriel is going to be the first to show up if God ever decides to call this all quits. It's more likely than you think, too. Humans are sinful and often turn to other forces these days. And in so many movies, Gabriel is the big bad guy who causes all sorts of problems for humanity. When you're the first angel to show up, you'd better believe you're going to catch a lot of folks off guard. And finally, at number one, we've got Michael. To cap off our list, the head archangel himself. He's the one powerful enough to push Lucifer out of heaven. He's the one strong enough to end the angelic war. He's the one righteous enough to prevent Samael from tearing a baby from its mother's womb. Nothing can stop Michael save for God himself, so why would he be on this list? Well, that kind of unchecked power can never be good, now can it? As the most powerful angel in creation, he has control over all of the other angels. God leaves him in his stead to rule over the kingdom of heaven. And if Michael were to ever change things up, it's unlikely that anyone would be able to do anything about it. If Michael looks down and deems our world unworthy, we're done for. Game over. The book of Revelation will come to fruition and all mortals will suffer before being cleansed from the earth. Coming in number five, we've got trumpeting angels. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a good trumpet solo. It's a beautiful instrument with so much room for expression and range. However, these angels aren't likely looking to play some blues scales, nor are they going to run through a sorrowful ballad. They're playing these trumpets as a way to kick off the horrifying festivities of the end of the world. The seven trumpets shall be played by seven angels, each of which marks the beginning of something terrible. This all happens after humanity has already been reduced to tatters and folks are living in caves, so hot start. But it does get hotter, because the trumpets are supposed to raise hell. Let's run through all seven and see how we feel. The first trumpet rings out loud and clear, summoning a storm of hellfire. Hail, fire, and boiling blood will rain from the skies upon those still present on earth. This is so spicy hot that all the grass and trees still standing will be burned down to nothing. Anyone outside of their cave dwelling will be cooked too. Now, you might be thinking that the sea is a good, safe place during all of this, but not so. As the second trumpet begins the process of breaking down a burning mountain and sending all the pieces into water, reducing the wildlife to blood and destroying any human-made vessels. Trumpet number three fells a star named Wormwood, sending it careening down to Earth. When it touches down, it poisons a portion of all the waters on Earth, whether they be rivers, lakes, oceans, or streams. There are stark few comforts left at this point, but things can get worse. All of the light from the sun and stars disappears at the sound of the fourth trumpet, which can't be very well received by the folks still surviving. After darkness reigns, an eagle will swoop down and warn folks of the next trumpets and their consequences. Number five brings about another fallen star, this one carrying a plague of locusts that are meant to torment any non-believers. Now here's where things get really dire. Trumpet six unleashes four very special, very violent angels. This fearsome foursome will send 200 million horsemen down to earth to cut through a third of humanity using fire, smoke, and sulfur. Holy smoke, they're not messing around. Worse yet, their horses barely resemble anything equine. They're chimeric abominations with heads of lions, snake-like tails, and horrible breath. Lastly, number seven kicks off a brand new set of tortures for those who remain on Earth, led by another set of awful angels. Let's talk about that in the next entry. Coming in number four, we've got the seven bowls. The trumpets were just a warning, a sign of things to come. And while the angels who played these deadly instruments are bad, the angels in charge of these heavenly bowls are so much worse. Plus, they look like they're bringing down holy offerings, which gives folks false hope before realizing what's actually going on. So seven angels take up seven bowls or vials or whatever vessel you can imagine and bring the contents down to earth. They then begin pouring whatever's inside down upon the ground, and then things go really sour. Inside these bowls resides pain and torture, plague and disease. Anyone who made it through the trumpeting will then be annihilated without remorse. Folks develop oozing sores, rivers are filled with blood, people literally combust on the spot. It's all very wild. And the fun doesn't stop there either. As plagues spread through the world and those who have sinned suffer lifetimes of pain, even more madness is poured by these bull-bringing angels. After the Euphrates River dries up, battles between kings of the world will begin and more lives will be lost. And to top everything off, the bulls bring about the most powerful and destructive earthquake that mankind will ever see. No disaster to date will compare to the chaos whipped up by this massive quake, leveling entire cities in seconds, opening up enormous chasms in the earth, and generally making it really hard to have a good time. Damn. 
So what at first appears to be a reward for surviving the Trumpeteers actually becomes an ever greater punishment. These angels literally split the world apart with a quake after implementing all sorts of legendary suffering. Jeez Louise, I thought these guys were supposed to protect and watch over humanity, not absolutely annihilate everyone. Coming in number three, we've got the False Prophet. Whether this is actually an angel or not is a point of contention, but I believe that this presence is employed by the heavens regardless. So we'll allow it. This beastly brute will arrive just in time to sway the hearts of weaker humans, and then condemn them for falling to his trickery. During the Divine Trumpet solo, a horrifying beast will emerge from the sea, killing many. However, the beast will be injured after this. Once that is complete, the false prophet will rise. This entity will force anyone around to worship the first beast, causing them to be branded with the mark of the beast, or 666. Any who comply will be damned, of course, and will also suffer immensely once the plagues from the bulls rain down. But really, did any mortal have a choice in the matter? The beast from the sea is powerful enough to frighten anyone into submission, so what else are they supposed to do? During a reign of hellfire like that, there's not too much in terms of rational thinking or hope. I suppose it's a test to see if those who are truly devoted to God are ready to simply die with the knowledge that they'll be saved. But still, that is a hardcore trust test. Coming in number two, we've got the of Babylon. Another questionably angelic figure, but one who appears nonetheless. As chaos reigns around the world, the whole of Babylon will descend upon humanity riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. She will be drunk on the blood of martyrs and saints and looking for a good time. And by good time, I do mean blood. This is interesting, as this particular figure seems to be representative of a political movement at the time. Scholars often accept her as a symbol for Rome, with seven heads representing the seven hills of Rome, and the ten horns standing in for the ten emperors who seem to be pushing for a less Christian world. So even if this promiscuous beast rider wasn't an angel from heaven herself, she represented something that God would have abhorred. And in being a symbol to rally against and hate, this Babylonian beauty probably steered folks back in the direction those at the church appreciated. Interesting, right? And finally, at number one, we've got Abaddon, God's chosen angel of death, the supposed location of the Lake of Fire, and a legendary name overall. This figure is said to have released the locusts mentioned earlier. A swarm of locusts probably isn't that bad in the grand scheme of things. They can block up the sun and eat all your crops, but that is a minor setback. However, Abaddon's locusts, that's a whole other story. These hellish insects are ready to go to war. They're said to appear as war horses with human heads and thorny crowns. With long flowing hair and teeth as sharp and strong as a lion's, they're instructed to torture anyone without the sign of God on their forehead for five long months. It seems a little excessive, but here we are. This is an angel who's all about cleansing the world of impure people through death, and the fact that he also commands these hordes of nightmare bugs only serves to intensify his wicked reputation. If there's an angel better known for cruelty and unforgivingness, let me know. But for now, we'll let Abaddon top the list. I hear there's a hotel somewhere that shares his name. In at five, Aquil. Now, there is very little known about Aquil, but what we know is that he is the demon who presides over Sundays and exists within Christian mythology. His purpose is to destroy and degrade the practice of keeping the Sabbath holy, which might not sound absolutely terrible, but if this dude possesses the wrong person, it could be bad news bears for all of us. Imagine the president, a prime minister, even one senator possessed, and suddenly we have have to work seven days a week without a single day off. Yeah, okay, it's a stretch, but there's a reason he is at our number five. Honestly, no one wants to work long weekends, just saying. Also, apologies in advance if I pronounce all these names wrong. I'm not a demon. Shh. In at four, Sergat. Now, Sergat is a minor demon referenced in the grimoire of Pope Honorius, but this does not diminish the fact that he is straight up evil. He's listed as, I quote, Sergat who opens all locks, and his opposite is actually our previous number, Aquil. So before we even get into this demon, we should discuss how many demons are actually mentioned in the great grimoire of Honorius. Who was he? Historians aren't even sure, but they do think that he was Honorius III, who was the Pope from 1216 to 1227. Now, no one is quite sure if he wrote the book or not, 
not, but he is famous among popes for deliberately conducting ceremonies to summon demons so he could banish the demons back down to hell. A little odd. This dude does not mess around. Now how does Sergok come into play? Well as previously mentioned, he makes appearances in the Grimoire Fenorius, and he is incredibly deceptive and cunning, making him one of the most terrifying demons throughout history. And in the bible. Yeah, he's there too. Now as quoted before, this dude is known as the one who opens all locks, which essentially means he is capable of understanding and opening any and all locks in the entire world, making it almost impossible to escape him or conceal yourself from him. When someone becomes Sergat's target, he relentlessly pursues them no matter how hard they try to escape. And once he reaches his victims, he frightens them by presenting them with images that result in them going mad. Yikes. Don't summon this bad boy. In at 3, Agarus. Agarus is a demon described in demonological grimoires as a duke. Under the power of the east, an old man riding upon a crocodile and carrying a hawk on his fist. Agarus is known to teach languages, however he also stops and retrieves runaways, causes earthquakes and grants noble titles. Now I shouldn't technically be saying he, because Agarus can be a man or a woman. If the demon is a man, the man is old and riding said crocodile. If the demon is a woman, she is young and angelically beautiful. Now it's surprising how many demons are teachers. They instruct those they visit or possess and grant knowledge and power, so I guess it's not all bad. The exorcists seem to miss out that little nugget of information. Now although this demon is downright evil, he or she will grant you the knowledge of every language in the world. However, the bad news, he or she will only teach you the foulest and most offensive words, so say bye bye to your friends, I guess. Yeah, you'll be educated, but you will be vile beyond belief. So, you'll be me. In at 2, Renov. In demonology, Renov is described as a Marquis and the Great Earl of Hell, hence why he is number 2 on our list. This dude commands 20 legions of demons, making him one of the most notorious demons throughout history, one that you certainly don't want to be messing around with. Now, what makes him quite the enigma is that yes, he's awful, the worst, but he's also somewhat of a scholar. He teaches art, rhetoric languages, and gives loyal servants the favour of friends and foes. Now, you may be familiar with this demon, as he is the one who wrote How to Win friends and influence people. Which is horrible enough, but what makes this demon truly terrible is that he is the taker of old souls. Basically this means anyone who is older, older looking, or looks a little under the weather, Renov will claim them. Also pets are not immune to this, he will kill them too. Your best option is just to steer clear of all your elderly relatives, and consider getting a new, younger looking pet. Just saying, they gotta go. And finally coming in at number 1, Baphomet. This name may ring a bell for you, and that's because Baphomet is a deity that the Knights Templar were falsely accused of worshipping, following which time it was subsequently incorporated into occult and mystical traditions throughout history. It first appeared in trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar beginning in 1307, which resulted in it being popularised in the English language in the 19th century during debate and speculation on the reasons for the suppression of the Templars. The appearance of Baphomet is that of a goat, an image drawn by Eliphas Levi, which contains binary elements representing the sum total of the universe. More interesting still, this picture of Baphomet is often used as a stand in for Satan, by Satanists and Christians alike. Now it is a highly debated topic about whether this demon was truly good or bad, but if we look to historical accounts, Baphomet comes from a letter written by a French crusader in 1098. He describes the crusader's enemies in the Holy Land, I quote, calling upon Baphomet prior to battle. Baphomet refers to Muhammad, the prophet. European Christian doctrine viewed the worship of Muhammad as idolatry, which was harnessed by a medieval European ruler in the form of a witch hunt targeting his political opponents. In at 5, Mammon. In the New Testament of the Bible, Mammon is a fallen angel. His name is thought to mean money, material, wealth, or any entity that promises wealth. He's essentially the embodiment of the cardinal sin, greed. Sounds like a swell guy. He is associated with the greedy pursuit of gain. I quote, you cannot serve both God and Mammon. He is often personified as a deity and is included amongst the seven principles of hell. According to some readings, he is the son of Lucifer himself, conceived before his father fell from heaven and born after he was sent to hell. Before his fall from grace, I quote, he was more interested in heaven's golden pavement than its celestial leader. From the underworld he comes up with schemes to manipulate humans into adding to his fortune. He is supposedly so powerful that innocent humans can be corrupted by him, adding to his treasures and fortunes instead of virtues that they can carry up to heaven. In at 4, Abaddon. Abaddon is known as the angel of the bottomless pit, one of the many fallen angels we have on our list. In the New Testament book of Revelation they are described as the king of an army of locusts as well as Destroyer, the Angel of the Abyss. As the King of Locusts, he has an army resembling horses with crowned human faces, women's hair, lion's teeth, wings, iron breastplates, and a scorpion stinger. 
nasty. Many believe Abaddon to be the Antichrist, but others identify him as the angel as Satan. According to Revelation 9:11, after the fifth angel sounds his trumpet, a star falls from heaven and opens the bottomless pit. As the storm of smoke arises, and from the smoke, a plague of locusts emerge to torment, but not kill, men who lack the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. His origin gets a little hazy, making him appear to be the servant of God, yet also a servant of Satan. I guess it's up to you what you believe. In at three, Belphegor. Belphegor along with a few other numbers on a list is a demon and one of the seven princes of hell. His powers are of seduction, seducing people with money and inventions, promising endless riches. His role as a demon is to turn humans against each other through means of wealth. He uses our gluttonous desires to drive man to evil, promising fortune in the end. Other reports label him as hell's ambassador to France. Odd title, and his adversary is Saint Mary Magdalene, one of the patron saints of France. His origin is that of a fallen angel and a false god that Moses handed down the death penalty for worshipping. He was dispatched to earth by Satan to deceive mortals, often taking the form of a beautiful woman, typically naked. Although sometimes he can appear as a demon, sporting leathery flesh, horns, sharp teeth, and a gaping mouth, ready to destroy mankind. In at two, Beelzebub. Identified in the New Testament, Beelzebub is the prince of demons. He holds a high position in hell's hierarchy and supposedly led a successful revolt against the devil. He is the chief lieutenant of Lucifer, the emperor of hell, and is often placed among the three most prominent fallen angels, the others being Lucifer and Leviathan. He is capable of flying, which is the worst, and is known as the lord of the fires or the lord of the flies. Beelzebub is rumored to be responsible for many demonic possessions throughout history. One of the most famous is the possession of Annalise Mikkel, a teenager who was diagnosed with epilepsy before a number of exorcisms were later performed, eventually resulting in her death. Beelzebub was also believed to be sowing his influence in Salem, Massachusetts. His name was repeatedly mentioned during the Salem witch trials. And finally in at number one, Lucifer. In classical mythology, Lucifer, meaning the bringer of light, was the name of the planet Venus, though in many cases Lucifer was represented as a winged child pouring light from a jar, or even a man bearing a torch. Now in Christianity, as we know, Lucifer became so obsessed with his own beauty and intelligence that he began to desire the honour and power that belonged to God, corrupting him and forcing God to cast him down to the underworld. It is also noted that once he was cast down, he changed his name from Lucifer to Satan, meaning adversary, and following the second coming of Christ, he was bound to the pits of hell during the 1000 year millennial kingdom over which Christ ruled. All in all, Satan is widely known as the devil himself, an evil entity that seduces humans into sin. He possesses power over the fallen world and a host of various demons. In Judah Satan is regarded as an agent subservient to God. There is no answer to whether Lucifer and Satan are two separate entities or whether Lucifer's fall from heaven created Satan. But an examination of several passages reveals that he can be none other than Satan, the devil himself. Coming in at number five, we've got Asmodeus. A lot of folks take great issue with some of those classic vices. You know the ones sex. Rock and roll, all plenty of fun, all the bane of Puritans and teetotalers across the globe. If you delve too deeply into any of the above, you could find yourself receiving plenty of disapproving looks. Too bad, considering how much folks tend to enjoy these things. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Hard to say, especially these days. Who knows when the good won't be available anymore. However, traditionally folks have looked down upon those consumed by lust, whether it be carnal, money focused, or otherwise. Thankfully you can blame a demon for all those urges. Isn't life funny that way? Who made up morality anyways? Why not just explain it all away by saying it's totally out of your control? Beautiful, it makes up for everything. So we've got Asmodeus, the supposed son of Adam, once an angel of harlotry. Of course, his angelic properties aren't really around anymore as he fell from heaven and now lives as a demon in the underworld. With time, he became more well known for stuff like gambling and lust, and somehow became Lilith's husband, which is fun. The two of them, both labeled temptresses, produced all sorts of demonic babies to keep the fires of hell hot. There's also the famous story of Asmodeus killing seven husbands in a row to keep one woman from consummating her marriage. Like every time she got married, Asmodeus would show up and murk her husband before they could do the deed. But then she'd go out and get married again. At some point you think she'd learn and see a pattern and stop feeding her suitors to a demon, but hey, maybe she liked the demonic attention. Asmodeus is pretty wicked looking too. Rocking three hideous heads, this demon gets around by riding a dragon. This isn't his only look though, as he can appear as a few other forms to appeal to different types of people. I mentioned gambling before, and anyone with that kind of habit can thank Asmodeus for it. 
Gotta love it. Lastly, his powers do tend to get stronger in November, so once Halloween wraps up, be on the lookout. Lust might not stick around as easily once everyone puts away their sexy costumes, but hey. Coming at number 4 we've got Abyssithibu. Rocking with another fallen angel here, we've got Abyssithibu. A little tougher to say in spell, but just as scary and powerful. Raunchy as all hell too. See, Abyssithibu left heaven at the same time as the devil himself and didn't take the fall that well. He used to be a flatterer of God, but once he took that trip to the down below, things got ugly. If you're familiar with the most legendary gaming villain of all time, you'll see some inspiration here. While falling, Abyssithibu was used as a life raft of sorts by other fallen angels. They grabbed at his body and managed to take hold of one of his wings. This led to the feathered appendage being torn off, leaving our poor demon to be with only one wing. Eventually it did sort of grow back, but not as it was. Mm -mm. Abyssithibu is known for having a red, grotesque wing. That's how many recognize this demon. Badass, but probably really upsetting to deal with after many lifetimes of perfect angelic wings. Like I said, once he made it to hell, things went extra south. He rules over Tartarus, which is essentially hell jail. All of the worst of the worst reside here, suffering eternal torment in a cage of their own creation. How lovely. Abyssithibu also has quite the command of sorcery, able to cast powerful spells and persuade influential figures to act in unholy ways. For these reasons and more, it was decided that this demon could no longer have sway over humanity. Abyssithibu was eventually trapped in a pillar of air, meant to be trapped for eternity. Tough break for sure. However, many do believe that Abyssithibu will return one day and bring with him thousands of years of fury after being trapped so long. His red wing will unfurl and he will return to his vengeful and cruel ways. Who's excited? Coming in at number 3 we've got Legion. One person can be many things, but in this case one demon is actually many demons. And these demons were so nasty, so evil, that Jesus himself had to exorcise them. Holy smokes, right? Legion is quite popular in the pop culture pantheon, and many famous exorcisms and related events seem to use him as the prime example. With so many demons dwelling within one main demonic form, they can take over the souls of people relatively easily and with varied results. However, all of the demons that make up Legion act as a sort of hive mind. They all have the same knowledge, thoughts, and reactions to things, and if one demon from the collective experiences something, they're all aware of it. With all of that knowledge and the ability to spread out all over the place, Legion can be a terrifying adversary. And even though Jesus does manage to send Legion back to hell in the Bible, there isn't much guaranteeing that many parts of Legion can't come back. Most folks only experience Legion as individual parts too. This is when the demon is at its weakest, as each individual piece of the whole only holds so much power. Were Legion to assemble all of the many together, we could be in trouble. Imagine all the limbs. Coming in at number 2 we've got Betis. Ah, corruption. Such a classic human form of folly. We work so hard to avoid it and even do our best to prop up those who remain pure of heart and purpose, but corruption spreads pretty much no matter what. We can thank Vetus for that. Second in command to Lucifer himself, this is the demon who wants to tempt holy people away from their chosen path. Even the most pious has a chance of being drawn in by this demon. He works very hard at figuring out people's deepest desires and then encouraging them to pervert everything they believe in to achieve said goals. Oftentimes these desires are less than socially acceptable and at worst they can be quite taboo. Does Vetus care that he's ruining lives? Probably not. He takes on different forms to be extra convincing and makes sure to really sweeten the deal whenever he can. However, there is a way you can tell if Vetus is trying to tempt you. He only speaks in rhyme. Interesting, right? Hold on, there's a form of communication that almost exclusively communicates in rhyme and tells people to act in all sorts of wild and depraved ways. Music. Pop music specifically, but hey. Do you think that Vetus is communicating with modern folks through the tunes we so often hear on the radio, telling us to consume, to cavort, to consummate? That's insidious. And finally at number 1, we've got Beelzebub. Speaking of music, how many songs explicitly reference Beelzebub? I can think of two right now, Bohemian Rhapsody and Beelzeboss. I'm sure there are plenty more, but you can drop those in the comments. As you do that, I'll continue on my way talking about this demon. Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, the devil, but also maybe not the devil. There's so much to say about this particular demon and so little time in which to do it. I'll see what I can do with what we've got today. So the lord of the flies may be associated 
associated with literature read in schools these days, but back before we had a tale of British boys losing their minds on an island, that association with insects was filthy. Ruling over flies meant you had domain over demonic excrement and rot. Not a good thing, right? Throughout history, people have blamed Beelzebub for all sorts of things. He was closely associated with the Salem witch trials and cited often when folks were put to death. Plus, years after that was called off, he was again referenced in many exorcisms, both infamous and unknown. All of this pales in comparison to his actual standing in hell though, where he is known as the Prince of Demons, and rules over the other basement dwellers with an iron fist. His ultimate goal is to destroy the world and it seems as though he's been planning this for ages. Tricking people into worshipping false idols, commanding other infernal beings, and sowing seeds of discontent, nobody's doing it quite like Beelzebub. I'd recommend learning a song, wicked enough to defeat the devil, otherwise you're probably ending up going down to hell with it. Coming at number 5 we've got Leviathan. Often associated with adjectives like aquatic and enormous, Leviathan is a word we often hear outside of the context of angels. It's a concept at this point. If something is a leviathan, it's an enormous sea monster, ready to swallow entire ships whole, prepared to annihilate fleets of submarines, waiting for its chance to appear in a monster movie. But here's the thing, leviathan isn't just some monstrous figure in the ocean, nor is it simply a huge roller coaster in Vaughn. Leviathan is also a demonic angel. Damn, that's a bad title. Let me tell you some more. The sea monster reputation is well earned, as Leviathan often appears or is described as an enormous sea monster or a gigantic whale. Oftentimes, he will destroy ships and other vessels that dare to cross the open sea. Poor sailors, am I right? A lot of folks do end up mixing him up with Behemoth, but we'll let it be for now. There's another roller coaster joke in there somewhere, but I don't have it in me to make it. Leviathan makes appearances throughout ancient texts, from showing up and being described as a Lovecraftian beast with the mere sight of it being overpowering, to a whale that traps another famous character in its belly for three days. That first one also details Leviathan's enormous horrible teeth, and a back covered in shiny shield-like scales. That's not all either. Apparently Leviathan can breathe fire, throws smoke from his nostrils, and has eyes that shine so bright they can blind you. My word, that is an incredible biblical beast. And somehow, some way, he's still considered an angel. What a world we live in, right? Then of course there's the tale of Jonah and the whale, and in this case, Leviathan could very well be that whale. We've seen him described as the enormous underwater individual before, so it fits quite well if you think about it. Overall, this is an angel that nobody wants to encounter, even on a good day. Gigantic, predatory, powerful, and full of folks it ate, Leviathan is crazy. It's for the best that it stays deep underwater, away from everyone else. Coming at number 4, we've got Chalky Dree. Now, instead of listing off 5 specific individual angels, we'll bring in a new group for this one, the Chalky Dree. Sounds kind of funny, but they're serious business. In some of our earlier angelic videos this year, we discussed the classifications of angels a little bit and found out about all sorts of interesting creatures. Gone was the idea that angels had to be glorious humanoid figures descending from above the clouds to play beautiful tunes upon harps. Angels could be chimeric abominations, too hideous for humans to lay eyes upon. That is just the case with the Chalky Dree. Oh yeah. To kick it off, let's talk about where these things live. Not in the heavens, or above the clouds, or anything like that. The Chalky Dree are so much more hardcore than that. These angels have decided to take up residence in the sun. You know, the enormous ball of fire in outer space that burns bright enough to warm our entire planet from 150 million kilometers away? Yeah, they live there. I'm sure their tans are immaculate. Described as marvelous and wonderful, or in my words, overwhelming and intense, these angels take on very interesting forms. Their feet and tails are like that of a lion, offering up claws and speed unlike most others. Something, something, everything the light touches is ours, right Simba? Well, that's only partially true, because the Chucky Dree also have heads like crocodiles, adding in a new measure of deadliness previously unheard of. They're 900 measures in size, whatever that means, and have 12 angelic wings. And for some reason they seem to be rainbow colored. So a Technicolor lion-crocodile combo with angel wings pops out of the sun from time to time to bring heat, dew, and rays to the folks on Earth. You know what? Maybe they're not so bad after all. Coming in at number 3 we've got Belphegor. And we're back to individual powerful angels. This one in particular is a well-known fallen angel, which tends to be the case a lot of the time. Belphegor is associated with plenty of sinful behaviors. There's greed, sloth, discord, selfishness, and more. Although, let's be real, sloth and greed are the biggest in his books. 
He likes to give mortals great ideas for inventions, therefore filling their minds with selfish greed. They'll devote great parts of their lives to these plans, forgetting all sorts of other important things. And often, if these inventions come to fruition, they don't actually improve the state of the world all that much. Yeah, it's mostly stuff that extracts more wealth from the world in the laziest and most destructive way possible. Then the inventions will also draw their users into sloth as they make things a little too easy. Classic Belphegor. Interestingly enough, this isn't a fallen angel who was on Lucifer's side from the start. However, when Lucifer and his supporters staged their rebellion against the heavens, Belphegor didn't explicitly side with God either. For this slight, he was inevitably sent down to hell anyways. Damn, you just can't win, eh? However, as we've seen, he's adjusted quite well. After his fall, he took to being a prince of hell quickly and started doing his best to preside over Sloth. At least he's adaptable. Coming in at number two, we've got Mastema. Known for his judgments and punishments of humans, Mastema is one scary angel. He's an arbiter, and you'd do well not to forget that. If Mastema gets the chance, he'll put you six feet under for eternity. Worse yet, he treats his whole job like a sting operation. Instead of sitting back and waiting for humans to do unholy things, he actively tempts mankind with all sorts of stuff to make them act out of turn. That's tough, huh? Like, you think you're living your life and then BAM! Mastema tempting you is something lovely but sinful. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? But that is what this angel does, and he does it well. Some say that Mastema and Belial are the same entity, just seen from different angles. Belial being the more demonic, and Mastema being more angelic. However, their actions are indeed the same, or mostly similar, from leading some of God's armies against angels, to controlling legions of demons to control and tempt humans on Earth. It's even said that Mastema was involved with the Watchers, who ended up causing that massive flood way back when. You know the story. So now Mastema is known as the tester of humans. Even after all of that chaos and mayhem, he's still trusted to do things in the name of God. And I'm not sure which is worse, damning people in the name of Satan or damning people in the name of God. I'd much rather an angel try to help people be better rather than entrapping them and seeing to it that they're sent to hell. But hey, I don't claim to understand how angels work. And finally, at number one, we've got Lucifer. If we were to tally up every list that Lucifer topped, what do you think the final count would be? It's probably a lot higher than I'm estimating, to be honest. But hey, it's not like his spot at the top is undeserved, right? Lucifer worked hard to earn the recognition of people around the world. Hell, there's even a popular TV series featuring this fallen angel. If you can think of a more famous or more fearsome angel than this, please let me know. But until then, we're putting Mr. L right at the tippy top, over and over again. You know the story. Lucifer was an angel without peer. Nobody could stop him. He was the ultimate in heavenly hunks. But then one day he let his pride take over. Instead of being happy that he was the creme de la creme of angels, he thought about usurping God himself. Wrong move, yeah? After organizing something like one third of all the angels in heaven for an uprising, they got beat by the remaining heavenly bodies and sent down to the underworld. So much hope, so much pride, so little execution. Since then, Lucifer slash Satan slash the devil has been watching over hell, doing what he can to bring order to the chaos. Someday he may rise up and take revenge upon those who smote him. Until then though, he's responsible for a whole lot of human folly. Goodness gracious, right on, right on.